Welcome back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. I'm in London and at UCL, where we're going to be speaking about why we post and social media. And specifically, I'm here with Professor Danny Miller, who is from the Anthropology Department at UCL. Welcome. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me, Steve. Well, thank you for coming on. And maybe if we could start with uh, this project that you put together called Why We Post. Uh, why did you do that, and what does it mean, and, and, and what does it mean going forward? Well, the position was this, that every day in the newspapers we were seeing things said about the impact of social media, you know, it fries your brain, or somehow um, people didn't understand what a friend was anymore, or it was going to allow people to communicate in exciting new ways they hadn't had before. And we read all this, and then we're saying, well, just wait a minute, because the point is that Indian farmers use social media, Chinese factory workers use social media. So when you make these claims about what social media is doing, who actually are you talking about? Are you talking about everybody equally? Or is it just the students in your college you happen to have talked to? Or what? So the only way you can answer that is if you organize a program of research that actually includes Indian farmers as one of your field sites, Chinese factory workers, which was indeed one of our field sites, and many other sites in Latin America, in Europe, and across the world, and tried to start a scholarly enterprise which looked at precisely what did these people do in all these different sites, because that actually is what social media is. Social media is not just the platforms that are put out there by companies. Mostly, it is the content that is created every day. And therefore, that led to the question, why we, the world, post? Why do we do this? And the answer is very, very variable, because in some cases, it may be essentially a family medium, where somebody's got, you know, a Facebook profile and um, their older relatives possibly are immobile, it keeps them informed about what's going on. Now, that may have been Facebook then, it may be migrating, say, to, to WhatsApp now, where, you know, you want pictures of the, the newborn in the family, like, every half an hour. But then there might be somebody else who actually has no interest in that at all. Some of these Chinese factory workers, for example. We thought they would also be using it for recontacting the families back in the villages that they came from. But they didn't. They actually used it for connecting mainly with strangers. And they were interested in chatting about the new metropolitan world. Because after all, they had migrated into what they saw as this modern world, you know, closer to places like Shanghai, etc. And they wanted to become part of that. So they will be trading these pictures of, you know, when I'm going to be married and become a princess or when I'm going to be living in this fancy house in, in Shanghai, etc. But essentially mainly with, with um, strangers. And each place would have its own specific configuration of uses that only made sense in that particular place. I guess mentioned Indian farmers, for example. Well, how would they be different? Because Indian society is organised into specific groups, a hierarchy of what's called castes. So it's a big issue there of who is talking to who. Can males and females actually interact across those lines? Or if they do, is that then a problem? Um, what about the local politics in each situation? I mean, in that situation, the local politicians tend to be film stars. So actually, you might be using social media to interact with a celebrity fan site, which is also, in fact, a political campaign, and that would not be the same in some other place. So our point was, to answer the question of why people post, we have to start with, who are we talking about? What is their cultural context? And then try and get towards the specifics of why they post those particular content and how it relates to their offline lives. Well, that's really interesting. I guess from my perspective and our viewers' perspectives, many of whom are college students and college professors in the United States, I was thinking of something very different mm -hmm. than what you just said. But I'm an anthropologist. 
My job is to get people out of, if you like, the parochialism of their familiar surroundings and point out to them that the things they just, just take for granted, they assume, you know, you tend to assume that people are going to think the same things as you, do the same things as you, and then show them that actually it can be very different. Now, one of the nice things about social media is you really can show them. And I'll give you an example. Let's say, why do people post what they post when you become a, a mother for the first time, right? So if we go to the English site where I did field work, and you look on Facebook, and I had access to many, many Facebook profiles, right? Um, what they tend to do is they have their new infant, and there might be a profile picture of them with their infant, and then they disappear from their own Facebook site the infant becomes their profile picture. Um, it's not the Facebook site of the infant, it's the Facebook site of the mother. But she completely replaces herself with the infant. And for maybe a year afterwards, you've got different pictures of the infant standing for her site. She's sort of disappeared. Now, compare that. What do new mothers do where the other place where I was working, which is in Trinidad? You go onto a new mother uh, and her Facebook site and you will see her looking glamorous, cool, the fanciest, most stylish kind of clothing you can imagine. Because what she is saying is, you know, sure, I've just become a mother, but don't you think for one minute that just because I have become a mother, I am any less cool or glamorous or out there than I was before. So you can take the same process, becoming a mother, but in these two contexts, what we post and why we post is totally different. And can I give you one more example, just, just to sort of show this. Um, we, we, when we first started doing the work, uh, I remember the, the guy working in, in Brazil, you know, and he was working in a very low income society and he was saying well you know the people around me obviously they're, they're not going to post where they really live you know half built kind of mud brick and, uh, and houses etc and the conditions of poverty basically they will post oh you know here i am next to a swimming pool here i am next to a gym because they want to show their aspirations they want to show who they could be same time the woman who was doing her field site in chile said you know wait a minute what what, what are you talking about I also work with a low-income society, but everybody knows the truth about the people around them. If you started doing that, they think, what, what, how can you say that? We know you don't go to a swimming pool, etc." They would never show those kind of postings. They'd show the postings of how they actually live and who they actually are. So again, similar situation, low income, both Latin America, totally different ideas about why we post. And that's something that most of us have no idea about until there is research that actually can demonstrate and show the level of difference that actually exists out there in terms of social media. And those differences are really interesting. I guess what I was thinking of when you were explaining that uh, a little bit more as I was thinking about the internal and the external. So some of that was about what I, who I am, mm -hmm. and part of that is about who I want the outside world to, to see. Mm -hmm. And so they're not exactly the same. They're not, but I wouldn't say one was necessarily more real than the other. I mean, if you say, oh, that's not real because a person really can't afford that. Well, it's not their fault they can't afford it. They just, if they had the money, they would be able to afford it, right? As far as they're concerned, the real person is the one who should have had the money to be able to post in a swimming pool. They think the one that you might say is less real is actually more real. So what does that bring up academically? It brings up a very interesting question of what's real and what's real to, to particular people. And actually what we would do is we would respect the fact that online life can often be a place where people realise who they've always wanted to be or now think they can be um, and is not simply some kind of virtual other. The thing that they think is false is a life of poverty. They're actually having to live offline. So in the Einstein example, that would be he's not a postal worker, he's really a, a visionary scientist. Exactly. Um, and sometimes these people are able to realise it, and sometimes they actually realise it 
through social media, because social media gives them experiences they may never have had. And you kind of took for granted that that's who they were, because actually what they were was often just a constraint. So you might say, oh, here's a society where nobody talks to strangers. They, they have nothing to do with strangers. Well, that's because they couldn't. Now they, this is a, a different Chinese site where now they've got social media. They love talking to strangers because they can tell them all the things they can't tell their relatives and they can't tell their friends about what they really think about um, all sorts of things in life. You know, the only person you can really disclose that to is somebody you're never going to meet and never doesn't know who you are. Um, and they will exploit that possibility. And that's a possibility given to them by social media. And one of the interesting things about that is that when I work in places like the UK, and I imagine it would be the same in the US, you know, there's a lot of fuss about social media as kind of the death of privacy, the end of privacy, we're losing our privacy. But when we work in places like China and India, we have these people saying, you know, this, this privacy thing is very fashionable and modern, but we never had the opportunity. I mean, we don't have separate rooms. Um, the first time we ever even encountered this privacy thing was actually thanks to social media. So in half the world, it's the death of priv privacy. Another half the world, it's the birth of privacy. But that's what it actually is. But you're saying another thing. You're also saying it's about aspirations. Well, I'm saying aspirations to be other than what you have had to be as a result of constraint. So aspiration can, for you, be either who you really would be, but you've been stopped from being, or it can be the other way around. It can be you're, you actually think the person you currently are is real, but you have a fancy aspiration that you could be. So probably when they're posting to say, oh, this is me as a princess, um, no, I suspect it probably is, they would accept that that is maybe the less real element. But when they are posting to say, you know, I am actually have a decent education and I'm a decent person, I don't know that mean because that's what they actually think they could have been or should have been if circumstances had allowed them to be. So a lot of the language that has tended to be used, not just for social media, but the internet generally, you know, real, virtual and so forth, we think these need to be questioned. Um, because it was always the case that people lived in multiple worlds. Is the real person you when you're with your family? Or is the real person you when you're doing your job? Or is the real person you at prayer? Or the real person you... They're all multiple contexts. What online gives you is another context in which you can be you. And our attitude is simply to take that as one other context along with all the others. It, has, it is not less authentic or less real. Um, it is simply another place where people become possibilities that they might previously not have realized they could be. And in terms of those possibilities, so if I was a rural farmer mm -hmm. in you know, country X or Y, then I'm now going to be able to envision my life in a broader context through talking to people on social media. Yes, that's true. So it's, it, it, it's more than simply the idea that you already had an aspiration which you can now fulfill. And usually there's a sequence to this. That, that's the first part. You know, even as a farmer, I thought, well, I could be maybe a wealthier farmer with more cattle. And so at first you might imagine yourself in that possibility. But then as you go online, you experience a more cosmopolitan world and you see the life of somebody who has nothing to do with farming. Um, maybe to be a doctor or um, maybe a film star, etc. And you start to think, well, you know, I can maybe have an, an avatar and dress them up as that and um, imagine myself of that and portray some of my time as that. But that doesn't mean it's completely unreal. It means they are now taking on that role. And we all all live by social roles, uh, the, the, you know, and they've always been multiple. It's nothing new by the fact that there is no one of us that is kind of the solid, grounded, authentic one and the rest are not. Uh, we, we always had different imaginations of who we are and also other people have imaginations of who we are, which we may disagree with. But I guess in the olden days, one could have said that this was captured in a fiction book? I think that the, it would be captured by somebody else in a fiction book, and yes, people might read a, a Mills and Boone book and imagine them being um, swept off by this guy on a, a, on a white horse, just as happened in the book. Um, but this is different. 
This, in social media, people and can engage for many hours a day. I, I, I'll give you an example, right? I did some work with uh, Filipino domestic workers. Um, who actually whose children were back in the Philippines and I was what I was interested in that project was could social media allow you to be a mother again because previously you'd been hardly able to be in touch with the children that were left behind in the Philippines now you could contact them 20 times a day did this make you a mother again in the, in the way that you wanted to be now I remember one of my informants who I knew very well and she was living in London um, and she was earning her living in London doing care work and essentially yes you could say her real life was in London because she lived there she slept there she ate there she worked there but actually she never went out to a pub a film socialized with the English or anything like that when she wasn't working and sleeping and eating she was online with her Filipino family and friends, always online. Because the only place they could be together would be on social media. And she spent far more hours of the day online with her Philippine connections than she ever did offline with the people who lived around her in London. So where did that person live? Did they live in London, sleep, eat? work or did they live online where actually that is the life that they would have regarded as their real every day most of the hours that they were awake and not working life and our job is to respect that and say it's not up to us to decide here what is real not real what we have to do is we have to try and empathetically understand the people we're working with and realize that the way they use these things, the way they understand these things, the experiences they gain from being part of this may just be different from anything we had even imagined. Um, and then we research that, we write about that, and we help each other to learn and respect that other people in the world might just be very different in terms of what social media is and, going back to the question, why they post. That's really interesting. So I guess in, in your example, she would be living in London, but she was really of the Philippines. I would say she's really living in social media. She's sleeping in London and she's working in London. No, I would say she is living in social media. It just makes more sense to say that's where she lives, actually lives. The backdrop is what she has. She has to be in London, but she's not doing much living there. She's just working and sleeping. <laughs> so your point is that she's that, that one can live in social media. Yes, that person demonstrates that it is possible to without you know, and it's not a gimmick or anything to say. Just sent commonsensically, it can make sense to say that somebody is living in social media, and not because it's some kind of fantasy or virtual or something else. That's just the place where they occupy themselves in the life that actually matters to them. But one could say that about a teenager in the United States. Absolutely, one could. And some people will, will you know, realize that possibility. So the point of anthropology is precisely that we don't take our categories and impose them on everybody else as though what we assume is meant by living or places or meaningful or not meaningful has to be the same for everybody else. Um, our job is to say, well, you know, um, we may think they're weird, but they might think we're weird. Um, everybody's weird to everybody else. And the point is to learn to treat other people with respect and understand that from their point of view, what they do makes sense to them. And if we were to understand where they're coming from, the context they're brought up in and living, and the possibilities that social media allows for them, yes, I can now understand, first it looks very strange that they would do this thing, like, you know, why would an English woman disappear from her own Facebook? But if you understand the circumstances, you can see, yes, this is, from their point of view, completely reasonable behaviour, and it makes sense for them. And that is a large part of what anthropology is trying to do, to, to educate ourselves about each other. So our job in anthropology is to say, you know, unless, somebody, unless you know somebody well, unless they trust you, unless they're going to open it up, unless you know the background, because 
The fact that they're not doing it on the phone might be because their wife's doing it. So if you don't know what the wife is doing, you don't understand what the husband isn't doing, etc., etc. These things exist in, in, in context. And that's why it's this deep qualitative work. Quantitative research will tell you nothing. You counted how many apps you have on this phone, half the mob wouldn't even be used, right? Um, it, it's all context. Because again, if you've counted counted it on that person's phone, it's not telling you about the other wider relationships they have with other people, um, which are the reasons they may be doing something or not doing something. So it's this deep, nuanced, qualitative investigation that opens up a smartphone and actually gives us, I think, an answer to a very important question. What were, you know, the first one was, what is social media actually? which means what is its content, what is its use, what is its consequences, and now what is a smartphone? Um, and that can only be discovered through this long-term, deep research. I don't think there's any shortcut that can answer that question. Well, that's interesting. What about teaching students how to do that? What we're doing, basically, is, uh, firstly, we do not accept students who do not have a very, very thorough training in anthropology, and that also means ethnography. So that means they have to learn things that you don't learn from reading in books, right? It's about, we do pilot projects, we get them used to actually engaging with, with people. Um, my students are very surprised, because when I first meet a postgraduate student, I tend to meet them in the pub, not my office. They say, well, why, why are you meeting me in the pub? They say, well, I know you can write an essay, but if you want to do ethnography, people have got to like you and get on with you and trust you and interact with you, because that's how we do our field work. This is the place where, you know, um, you've got to work. You're not going to be working, you know, you're not going to be doing this in office. You're going to be in people's homes. Actually, you often are going to be in the pub. It's one of the favorite places. I, I'm dealing now with a slightly older group, so I mainly work in cafes. Um, but it's the, it's the same sort of thing. So actually, it's training people to be interactive in what you might call real-world situations with ordinary people and those people being comfortable with them. And that actually is something you really have to think about and work on and understand the ethics, for example, which can be quite complex in these situations um, before they go out into the field. But it's also, you know, there's a limit to what you can teach them because sensitivity varies from place to place. I could say something to somebody in Ireland, but if I was in Japan, it would call great offence. So actually, I always say to these people, this is on-the-job learning. You start, um, but your, your method develops and changes. I, we're one of the few people that actually disapprove of consistent methodology. Because all that tells us is that people haven't learned from their experience. If they are learning, they should be changing their methods in order to become more sensitive to the particular people they work with. So, for example, because um, we're, we're interested in smartphones and also kind of ageing, etc., I find in Ireland I start with interviewing on the smartphones because people find that relatively neutral, and then I will talk about issues of ageing later on. Whereas my colleague who's working in Japan, she found exactly the opposite. The smartphone was such an intimate object, people were very reluctant and resistant at first to talk about it. Talking about ageing, even talking about death, was kind of relatively okay. So she went that way around, and then when people trusted her and they were comfortable with her, she would start talking about smartphones. So that's the point. If you're too pedantic or rigid in, in your teaching of methodology, you're actually going to cause problems. You're teaching people to actually be sensitive to social situations um, so that people, above all, can be comfortable and understand what it is that they're engaged in when they're working with an anthropologist as an ethnographer. Um, so it's very clear what's going on here and who this is contributing to. And again, the issues of privacy and issues of ethics were, are, are going to come up. When you're looking, you know, what somebody's actually posting on their WhatsApp, um, that's private, often family information. They have to trust you that you are not going to disclose, um, that there's a good reason why you'd be looking at things like that, um, etc. So there's lots, of, there's lots of things involved in the training of people to do good ethnography. Well, fair enough. I, I think we only have a few minutes left. If you had just a little advice to give to viewers who perhaps are not professional anthropologists, what would you like them to do? 
one of the things we would suggest is that if you're interested in understanding that people out there in the world uh, do very, very different, different things from you. A lot of the creativity today is just from you know, I go to somebody and um, it's the, the grandson is having to see grandma who's not very well and fairly elderly is completely bored, but they spend their time coming up with something interesting to do with an iPad. So remember, so for example, um, this happened where this elderly lady, I think, I can't remember, maybe she had Parkinson's, her hands were shaking a lot, and he said, well, you know, you've got this little wooden device, you used to put your recipe book on that. Put your iPad on that, and then you'll find it easier to use because the, the fact that your hands shake won't be an encumbrance in using an iPad. And that's typical. It, 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 all this creativity, this didn't come from any company, didn't come from a government. It's the creativity of users. And there is so much out there that we can learn from simply by observing those users and seeing how they adapt these devices for purposes that really matter to them. And then what I would try and do, observe, learn about those things, and then potentially tell other people. You know. So let's say I observe this in one person who has Parkinson's, or maybe that's something you want to post to a forum dealing with Parkinson's and say, hey, do you know what this person's done? Maybe you could, you could learn from that. So we're the people that we learn from below, the smartness from below, and then we try and spread the word so that people th throughout can benefit from other people. We're like, we're like the peer-to-peer -peer people, right? <laughs> okay? Who, but, but somebody has to observe in the first place, respect, acknowledge, document, disseminate, and then other people can know about it. And that is another important function, I think, of this anthropological approach to these new media. One of the things we feel is very important, people are really interested in social media, so we're doing a topic that everybody wants to know about. So we were very careful to give many different levels of research dissemination. You can look at the website, you can look at social media, you can look at YouTube videos, you can use our free university courses, or indeed you can read the books, which of course is what we ideally would like. But all of these will get you thinking about something which actually, I suspect, uh, once people start looking at these things, usually they are absolutely fascinated because they just didn't think that anybody would be using social media in a completely different way from what they assumed social media actually were. And that in and of itself is a, is a really interesting discovery and will expand your education. Well, on that note, you expanded my education because I wasn't expecting some of the answers you, were, uh, you gave today. So thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. If you would like additional information about Danny Miller, who is actually Professor Daniel Miller, please visit the UCL website at ucl.ac.uk. If you would like to contact me directly, please go ahead and do so by sending an email to highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman. And you've been watching Higher Education Today.